All right, so before we get into the video, I need to take some ownership. What I'm sure did not come as a shock to anybody that knows me, I was an idiot and said some things I shouldn't have. Um, last Saturday, I put a video out responding to um, a comment that the Stone Point cast had made on one of our videos. And um, in my video, I definitely took a couple of cheap shots at Drew. And I was wrong, and I shouldn't have done that. Um, I'm not going to be one of those people that comes out and, um, says something stupid or do, does something stupid and then immediately throws out like a half-hearted apology or tries to like erase like it ever happening. Um, <clears throat> I did go through and I did edit out, edit out, um, the, the cheap shots that I took out of the video, but I'm just going to own, um, I'm just going to own it. I, I was immature and I'm going to own that and um, do my best to move on from that. Drew is honestly somebody that I do respect as a content creator. Um, he did a lot to help me set up um, teaching me how to do some of the recordings and things like that. And I think he does ha absolutely have a fantastic channel. Um, that All of that being said too, I made the video because one, it was a topic that I did want to discuss. And whenever I put out a tier list or people put out a tier list, I, I like doing those because they cause a lot of debate and a lot of um, good discussion and things like that. And I think one of the things that I really want to discuss is people get so passionate about it. And I wanted to really talk about how, you know, metagames keep changing and evolving and... Um, and rotating, like the top decks will rotate in a lot of different metagames, um, with some exceptions in decks that are just overly dominant, things like um, um, Raylar and RSTPK is a great example of that. And when Drew made that comment on the video, it just was like a good chance to do, and, and I'll be blunt, it was like a clickbait video. Um, it was a good chance to talk about something I really wanted to talk about, but, and at the same time, um, in my eyes at the time, do it in a way where um, it would draw some attention. And I don't always think attention like that is bad. If it brings some um, attention to my channel, it brings some attention to Drew's channel. Um, the way that I went about it, though, was absolutely wrong. And like, once again, I'm going to own that. I'll own the immaturity on that. Um, I'm going to stand by... I think there were some good messages in that video. I just think my approach to it was horrible. I'm also going to stand by that tier list video that I did, um, or the original tier list video that I, I did, um, because I was very upfront in that. I, I'm like, hey, I haven't tested this format a ton, but I'm going to put this video out because I think some, um, not a whole lot of players have really played this. I think it's some um really good discussion and i think it's gonna be a fun video to do and like i said i just i do i feel like i have a lot of experience not only playing during all of these years but also um a lot of experience really building rogue decks innovating formats coming up with um meta defining decks and i really i'm gonna stand behind my my reputation as far as doing the video and why I do videos like that. And to be blunt with you, we'll probably do more videos like that in the future. And the only other thing I want to say is, um, I don't, I don't want, I don't expect everybody to agree with me. And to be honest, with you, I don't even want everybody to agree with me because if everybody agreed with me, um, that, that doesn't generate a lot of good discussion. So by all means, um, you know, every video I post, there's always some, Oh, Hey, great video. Really appreciated this. Really appreciate that. And then a lot, there's always going to be comments that are like, oh, no, you're wrong on this. You know, this is bad. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Um, and those comments, both sides of that is totally fine. Um, the big thing that I would ask and, you know, obviously it's the Internet. People are going to do whatever they want. But the only thing that I ask is if you disagree with me, tell me why. You know, hey, I, I don't think you should attack this in that deck because X, Y or Z or, you know, I really prefer to play it this way. And this is a great way to do it. Um, let's generate some good discussion out of it. I'm I'm not one of those people where I think I'm right 100% of the time. Um, obviously, when I do a YouTube channel, a lot of it's going to be my opinion and my thoughts on stuff. But 
hundred percent, you know, make, um, a hundred percent that I, I, I own that I'm not going to be right on absolutely everything. And I think you can get some really good discussion out of some of these videos as well. So, um, anyways, once again, I'm going to own, um, the immaturity. I'm going to own how poorly I went about that situation. Um, and I'm going to focus the channel on getting back to playing some really cool decks, building some really cool rogue decks and just staying positive on everything. So let's go ahead and just jump right on into the video. I wanted to start a new series called why it won. And I wanted to look at decks that ended up winning worlds or doing very well at worlds and why they found the success they did and taking a look at the deck, the list, the metagame, and um, even how the deck held up over time to a more modern approach on it and how the formats changed and things like that. I think it's going to generate a lot of really good discussion and give a lot of really good insights into the game back in the day. The first list we're going to be taking a look at is going to be Team Magma played by Yamato. Now, um, this was the first World Championships held by Nintendo, and especially at the time, there was not a whole lot of... Um, I think the big things to remember is, there one, there was not a whole lot of international play. It's not like it was today where players are constantly traveling to different um, countries to play. There was not a whole lot of internet in general. Um, the internet, this is basically pre-internet on a lot of things. Obviously, the internet existed, but... Um, players did not discuss decks on the internet a whole lot. There was no way to test over the internet very well or anything like that. And sometimes I'm going to say players feel like, um, and I, I think there's, there's pros and cons to that because I think, um, nowadays the game is so much more accessible than it was back in the day because of all that information and that ability to test and find games instantly and everything else. But I also think back in the day, you had to you had to be a really good player, but you also, to do well at a lot of this stuff, you had to be a really good innovator and a really good deck builder. And like nowadays, for example, I can go out and I can net deck like an RCS Intellion list um, and put zero work into it and just have a deck that top aided the last regionals or something. And that was not how the game worked back in the day. Now, um, once again, there's pros and cons to that. Um, personally, with a lot of, I always enjoy card games that emphasize, that put a huge emphasis on deck building as a skill component in the actual game. Now, um, looking at the Team Magma deck, the kind of the funny thing of it was, was when Team Magma and Team Aqua got released, the Team Magma cards did not generate a ton of hype. Um, the cards that people were excited about from that set was the Blazekin EX, Swamp Bird EX, and um, the Gardevoir EX had been released earlier. But essentially the top three decks in America were um, Blazekin, Gardevoir, and Swamp Bird. And there was a lot of kind of round robin between those and strengths and weaknesses and pros and cons and everything else. So with all of these Team Magma cards, um, people were just, they're like, oh, this is cool, but they were far more excited about seeing these really, really strong, powerful EXs, and generally, that's what Pokemon pushed. They'd push the, you know, oh, the high HP EXs and, you know, things like that, just like they do today, um, and a lot of these Team Magma cards just kind of went under the radar, even though stats-wise, they were very good. So when it came to Worlds, um, I remember the night before Worlds, all these Japanese players were trading for Team Magma, and like the American players, we were just unloading this stuff onto the Japanese, like getting good trades for them and thinking we just, you know, um, we were just taking advantage of these Japanese players, you know, trading them these garbage Team Magma cards for really, really good meta cards, like, you know, Gardevoirs and Blazekins and Quasi EXs and all of that stuff. When in reality, the Japanese players knew, had a few secrets, we'll, we'll put it that way. Um, the actual Team Magma deck was, got out of the bag at the Grinders the day before Worlds because I think 
Um, the jet, the team magma deck actually ended up winning the grinders that went seven and oh, there were several others in the, the grinders that did very well that ground into worlds. Um, so players kind of knew it was a deck, but they didn't really have time to build it or test it. The lists were still secret. And, um, generally speaking, um, they they really didn't take it super seriously. It was like, all right, these guys got lucky. There's no way this, you know, like little Groudon is going to stand up to like a Blaziken EX, for example. Um, and Yamato ended up winning Worlds, I believe, undefeated that year with it. Um, and the deck is basically just a stats deck. Um, it's based around this Team Magma's Groudon that um, the only downside of the Groudon is you need at least three um you need four pokemon team magma in its name so filling the bench early is a really really big deal but other than that 100 hp and then you're hitting for 50 um if they have at least two damage counters on them you hit for 20 and then with combination of things like dark energy you're getting a lot of um um you can you can manipulate damage a lot of the way and the big thing at the time was a lot of players players knew what the good decks were but they weren't particularly great at building good consistent decks and we'll take a look at some of the the swampert and the gardevoir and the blazing decks from the time but generally speaking players played very very inconsistent lists so not only did you have a very straightforward team magma deck that was very good stats wise but it really took advantage of some of these very weak and awkward hands these slower setup decks would get just because players did not build super, super consistent lists. Now, um, Yamato's list held up very well over time, and he just basically maximizes his consistency in the deck because he's got four Groudon, four Zangoose, which will get the Groudon. Now, um, or any of your other support Pokemon, the important thing to remember about Team Magma Zangoose, and the biggest deck at the time was Blaziken. Blaziken played a lot of Rayquaza EXs. Now, everyone is bases their Blaziken list. Nowadays, they look very heavily at Chris Bullups, and we'll talk about that. But generally speaking, at the time, most Blaziken decks ran two or three Rayquaza EXs, and that was one of your main attackers. Team Magma Zangoose would very easily one-hit knock out a Rayquaza EX, and you'd make some very favorable price trades because you could use Magma Energy to get that knockout, and you're really not risking a lot of your energy development. Now... Um, I think in today's meta, I don't know if you need the four Zangoose, but it worked very, very, very well at the time um, for him based around that. Um, the ball toy, the clay doll, and then he played the camera up line. So essentially what you would do is you'd use camera ups, overheat, get an energy in play. You use that clay doll to then magma switch that energy to one of your stronger attackers, usually a Groudon or a Zangoose, um, and you'd get that free energy drop in play. This was not as good as like a fire starter for example or even a psy shadow or a water call in a swamp bird but um it allowed you to accelerate energy and then in certain matchups in certain situations clay doll was a very good attacker against decks like gardevoir and then camera could be a very good attacker against decks like skeptile for example now um the only thing that seems really odd to me in the pokemon lineup is that one numble i think he played very heavily around maxi when in reality he probably should have played a second numble here now, the other big thing for the deck is it had this Team Magma's Conspirator, which would let you search your deck for Team Magma basics or energy. So you could get your basic, you could get your energy. Um, <clears throat> it was basically a Roseanne's research well ahead of its time. Um, and then as far as the rest of the supporter lineup, he played just a consistent supporter lineup. It was three Stevens, three TV, three Underground, um, two Copycat. The only thing I'm going to say is nowadays I don't think you get by with playing less than four Stevens and less than four Copycat. Even at the time, I think three Stevens was probably a mistake. Um, Copycat was a little bit different. I don't know. I feel like players were playing less consistent decks, so if they weren't setting up, you probably weren't getting massive draws off of Copycat. So I could I can see the argument at the time not playing, not maxing those, but um, nowadays I think four Stevens, four Copycats is basically how you start about every 2004 deck. Um, the other kind of interesting thing is Underground Expedition um, saw almost no play from American players. Like, they just did not play it. Um, everyone just played TV Reporter. Underground Expedition was kind of like, uh, players were reading it when Japanese players played it against them, which I think is kind of cool. Um, 
but essentially there's we could do a whole video on the advantages of seeing that fourth card versus keeping two versus just drawing three and discarding one um generally speaking nowadays players do prefer that underground expedition seeing that additional card is generally considered better than the the, the extra plus one you get off of tv reporter um just because you're digging a little bit deeper in your deck even if there is some downsides with keeping less cards and then if you have multiple underground expeditions um they lose value because if you use underground expedition put two on the bottom and the next turn you use underground expedition you're only seeing two new cards so pros and cons on that um now maxing in general like players understood maxi was good but a lot of the american players that were trying team magma decks were using maxi to get out um huge 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 um team magma pokemon so like we would try to use it to get out like um team magma's um agron and like you know for us this was like the one thing that america the american player really realized was oh wow cheating out a stage two through a supporter was really 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 good the problem was that even if you're cheating out a stage two through a supporter that stage two still needs to be good so a lot of the team magma decks at the time were based around like trying to like drop these big team magma pokemon and then take advantage of it. But the problem is, is like a Team Magma's Aggron is really big, but it's, it's hard to get out. And damage-wise and stats-wise, um, it's it's no better than the Groudon or focusing on the Groudon. Now, in general, um, Yamada used Maxi as kind of like a Pokemon recovery card where he could either, um, like if a Groudon got knocked out or a Clay Doll or a Camera he could just drop it back into play instantly um, without worrying about evolving it or or anything like that and the only other recovery card at the time was like town volunteers so maxi in that sense was very very good but he generally played that maxi over that numel um and that's why he played one numel two camera up so he could cheat the he could cheat out the camera up through the maxi um but generally there wasn't a lot of great recovery cards at the time i think town volunteers was the only other one um so it, it was really easy just to to cheat something back in play get that fifth crowd on that sixth crowd on um throw one of your support pokemon back in play even at the cost of the supporter for the turn. And then lastly, two Briny's Compassion. This is really the strength of the deck, and I can't even tell you at the time how annoying it was to play against a Team Magma deck where you would put like, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 damage on a Groudon. Then they would literally just Magma switch one of the energies to a Bench Groudon and then Briny's Compassion it up. And it was just so difficult to try to knock out the Groudons. And I think Yamato played too, but I swear some of the other Japanese players would play like three or even four Brainies um, in the deck. And it just, the combo just felt broken. Um, it was so, so, so annoying to play against. But I think in more modern times, as players have played the format more, you do realize that Team Magma can get in situations where you get supporter locked where you know maybe you'll go steven's advice and then you'll draw into the brainies but the brainies is dead because um you already played the stevens and i think yamato realized that a little bit at the time and i think that's why he went with two brainies one switch even though a lot of players today still just go with like three brainies now um yamato played three pokemon reversal at the time and this was like a big issue at the time is there was like the japanese players would always flip coins. They refused to like roll dice. They would always flip coins and they would never flip tails. Like I swear every Japanese player I played against went for like three for three on reversals and they went like, you know, two for two on the magma balls or three for three on magma balls. So like, um, it just felt so unfair. It felt like they were playing gust of wind in the deck. And I remember at the time there was like a thing going around where like Japanese players, there was People would say, like, in Japan, there was, like, coin flipping competitions, and that's how the Japanese players got really good at, like, flipping coins. I don't know if there's any truth in that, um, but it was just kind of, like, I want to say, like, an urban legend that went around in, like, 2004 at Worlds, because it was just, like, every single player, U.S. player that played against a Japanese player, you'd just be like, oh my gosh, they hit all the reversal flips, or they hit all of these flips, um, and it was kind of funny, um, I guess, looking back on that, how how much everybody bought into that like urban legend of like Japanese players just don't flip tails on anything. Um, two magma balls 
And this is just for a normal item. This is once again, just showing the strength of like the Team Magma cards in general, where they're just really good general cards. For a normal item, you get at least a basic. And if you flip a coin, if you get the hedge, you can search your deck for an evolution. You can grab that clay doll, you can grab that camera. I'm a little surprised that he only played two. I really think there's some arguments in decks like this where you play like three or even four of the Magma Balls to really, really try to um, get your consistency going. The one switch. Um, and then he played three Desert Ruins. And I think this is super, super interesting as well because you'll see a lot of the Team Magma decks today will only play two Desert Ruins. And that's just more of a nod to how the formats changed because at the time, generally speaking, Blossom did not see a whole lot of play. And what would happen is players would play like just stadiums. So like Blaze would play like high pressure system. Um, Swamp Bright you'd see would play like Island Cave or something or no stadiums at all. And then same with Gardevoir. Sometimes they'd play like Magnetic Storm, Ancient Tomb or just not play stadiums at all. So you really needed that third Desert Ruins where you could um, basically if they play two stadiums, you'd still win the stadium war with that third Desert Ruins. I also feel like at the time, players played into desert ruins a lot more than they do now um nowadays they basically know what decks play like desert shaman which decks don't and they know if they're like well i've got a curly on the bench i can just leave that there until i actually need to play that guard of war down um or combustion or whatever so i think that is a little bit different in the format the other thing is and i remember at the time like being surprised so how do i want to say this um at the time players played very, very high energy counts. And I think that's something that's changed over time, where I think a lot of players at the time were playing 15 to 20 energy in their deck. Um, and that was just seen as kind of normal. And I think that's, players were still to some extent in that base set era where you played very, very high energy counts on things. And then as the game started going on, like 2005, 2006, 2007, players got more and more accustomed to playing fewer and fewer and fewer energy. And I remember like in 2000, like when I was looking back at the deck in like 2005, 2006, being like, man, that surprises me. He played um, so many energy cards. But I think the big thing to remember is um, Magma Energy is very good, but it doesn't, it's not like a turn attachment. Like you get those two energy, it counts for one turn, um, and then you discard it. So it's like, it's great to conserve your energy. Like if you know that Groudon is going to get knocked down next turn, you can like magma switch, um, an energy from the Groudon back to something else, like a Groudon on the bench, attach that magma energy. And then, you know, you lose the magma energy, but you, you don't lose that additional energy or the two additional energy you would need to attack off the Groudon. So essentially he only played four, 10, 11, 13, um, like attachable energies that you'd keep in play which was totally fine, but he in total he played 17 because of that Magma Energy. The only thing I, I really wish is I wish Magma Energy was like our energy where you got that plus 10 damage um, because it counts as dark too. But I think at the time, I feel like the game, I feel like Pokemon in general, sometimes are just too afraid to make cards a little too good, so they always kind of err on the side of caution with things, and I think that's why the Magma Energy didn't get that plus 10. The other thing was, um, and this was a little unusual is I would have thought he would have played like a fire energy in there um, to get back with the camera up. Instead, he just opts to play the two rainbows. Totally fine. Um, at the time, camera up was probably not an attacker in a lot of matchups. Like now you see the camera up very commonly needed to take out like blossoms and things like that or skeptiles. Um, in this format, that really wasn't as much of a concern at the time. You did need that psychic for Claydol against Gardevoir, but um, everything else is pretty standard. And you have that six and two that was eight attachable energies on the first turn to Groudon. And then Conspirator, of course, could grab it. So essentially, um, the deck didn't do anything special. It was just a very, very straightforward, consistent deck that put out good numbers in a very inconsistent meta. And we see that when we look at, um, this is the second. So essentially, Worlds in all three divisions was won by Team Magma. And I think one of the coolest things was, is in the finals of each division, it beat what America considered to be the best deck. So in the juniors, it beat Swamp Burt. In the seniors, it beat Gardevoir. And then in the masters, it beat Blaziken. And we're going to look at the, the second place juniors, seniors, and then masters deck list. Now, 
I think this is also where you see a lot of discrepancies in the deck building. Um, I feel like I feel like Masters have always you always see most competitive decks in Masters, but I think especially in juniors and seniors in this era, you saw a lot more gap in deck building than you might have in other eras. So um, this was the second place um, deck list for the junior. I believe it was Reed. I'd, I'm not even going to try to butcher the last name here, but essentially it was Swampert. And he just played a very... Swampert in general was just very good, especially in general in juniors. It was a very easy deck to play. It was very straightforward. Um, and it hit for really, really good numbers. Just All you'd have to do is tell your kid to keep attaching energies to the Swampert, and you just use Hyper Pump for the knockout. Um, Crushing Wave in certain situations was also very good, but it was just a super easy, straightforward deck to play. And then it was always based around this Delcati Magneton engine, which was just really easy to set up. But I think this is where you see a lot of um, a lot of things with the deck. Is nowadays I feel like players play far more consistent supporter lineups, and in the time they didn't, they played a lot more techie cards here, and they really, really, really relied on this Delcati Magneton engine to get where they needed to go, which is okay if you set up the Delcati Magneton engine pretty easily, but if you don't open that dense bars, you don't have the turn two Delcati Magneton, your deck can get very inconsistent very quickly, and that's what the Team Magma deck took advantage of. And we see this um, in Reed's list where, like, Dunsparce, like, the, the Pokemon lineup is fine. It's totally fine. The only odd thing is he only plays two Dunsparce, which is really going to hurt his setup. Um, against Juniors in particular, or, yeah, Juniors in particular, that Wobbuffet is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly strong where it just it's a safeguard pokemon it's really 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 easy um junior players in particular would play into it and then that sweet coon um it's a little bit tougher of a card to play but you can make some really good plays with that energy flip attack to move energy around and then that reverse stream where you could do really really large damage on it where you could just pile you know energy onto it and then just return them all to your hand and get one hit knockouts based off of that it's a good tech card in the deck um, all be really difficult to play um, in the junior division effectively. But once again, it's one of those cards where even if you're not playing it perfectly, you're you're still probably getting an advantage out of it. Now, um, but like I said, you see some really inconsistencies in the supporter lineup where at the time, a lot of these players relied very heavily on Delcati Magneton and then Oracle to get where they wanted to go. And you saw much lower counts of like Stevens and Copycat. Um, he did play the Underground Expedition too, which once again, I'm going to say was very rare for American players, but he didn't even bother to run the four at Dunsparce. He actually bothered to play a single copy of the, the Pokemon fan club in this. Um, you also see American players play very high, those energy counts there, and doesn't even bother to play the Lightning. Um, he just plays the multi for both the Magneton and the Wobbuffet. Um, his texts are, you know, pretty standard. I think a lot of American players at the time played ATM Rock, um, when Hidden Legends came out, like the American players were really high on ATM Rock. Um, you'd see decks that even would play like two ATM Rock or three ATM Rock because you'd only see like two copies of the stage one. So players were like, oh wow, if I play two ATM Rocks, I'm gonna limit my opponent to, you know, like two Blaze Guns or something. Which there's some good thought process in there, but the problem is, is it, you could play around it. So unless you really walked into like three rare candies or something with a rock, you were probably gonna be all right on it. Um, Two rare candies, just like once again, just relying very heavily on the Delcani Magneton Oracle. Um, I don't actually hate this in the junior division, because his game plan is he just wanted to consistently go Mudkip, Swampert, Swampert EX, and just do that as consistently as possible. Play the third stage one, um, play the Wally's trainings, things like that. So I actually think the deck is for juniors division was a very, very good, very smart play, but it's gonna be very different um consistency wise than what we see from Swampert decks today. The senior division played Gardevoir, and I think this is almost um, kind of the opposite than the juniors. The juniors deck was just very straightforward. This is, I think, a lot techier, and you really see that, but once again, plays very, very heavily on that Delcati Magneton engine. Um, plays four copies of Oracle. He does opt to play the three Elms to really try to consistently search it out, but once again, no copycat. Um one copy of Steven's advice goes very, very low on some of these draw consistency cards, but opts to go very heavy on his text. Three reversal, 
um, one switch, one warp point. Um, the weakness guard I actually think is very good. It probably won him most of the mirrors he played because you could basically send up a Gardevoir EX, attach this to it, and your Gardevoir EX is trading incredibly favorably with the opponent. Um, and then like one Ancient Tomb, one Magnetic Storm. So at the time, once again, these two rare candies, three of the stage ones, and we see this here as well, is really a nod to how high American players were on that ATM rock. And that Magnetic Storm is, once again, just kind of a nod to how um, Shifter was very, very, very popular um, coming into this tournament. And you even saw Chris Fulop say that he was going to play Shifter until Magma did very, very, very well. But um, just that that Psychic Resistance was just so hard for the deck to overcome. If you could stick a Magnetic Storm, which once again, players played very inconsistent list, it wasn't unreasonable to assume you could get a Magnetic Storm in play and ideally keep it in play for a couple of turns. Um, that Gardevoir EX could possibly, possibly push through several shift trees as well. Um, energy counts, once again, you see very high energy counts. You see the 10 um, Psychic, 2 Lightning, and then the 4 Boost. Um, this isn't super uncommon today. I think you usually see 14, 15 energy in here. Um, but once again, you're going to see those higher energy counts in a lot of these decks. And then lastly, it was is Phillips. And I think this is really, really a note because players talk about how dominant Magma was at the 2004 Worlds. Like, all basically players just rolled over for the Japanese players playing Team Magma. But in reality... Um, I think that's actually the wrong skitty. I think Philip actually played the other skitty. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he played the minor Aaron running. But um, in reality, Philip beat multiple team magma decks heading into the finals. He beat a magma deck in top eight and a magma deck in top four before he ultimately basically drew two dead hands against Shimato and ended up losing that game. And I think at the um so while players talk about how dominant Magma was and how it just dominated the, the world and dominated the U.S. and, you know, Yamato went undefeated to win Worlds, in reality, Fulop was doing very well against the deck. It was just the fact that he played so many of them so many times in a row that he ultimately just ended up losing one. I'm um, losing in the finals to it. So I don't even think Fulop's list is that bad against Magma. Um, and Fulop's list is held up Probably better than at least, definitely better than the first two decks we've taken a look at over just over the years for a couple of different reasons. Um, first off, Fulop is just a fantastic deck builder, fantastic player. But um, at the time, even losing in the finals, I remember that weekend going through those World Championships and beating Magma in top eight, and then I remember watching him beat Magma in top four, and he kind of had this like, um. Players were just in amazement because Magma had just been dominating the tournament, rolling through U.S. players. So to see Fulop come in and just um, be beating Magma decks gave him a lot of, like, I don't know if I want to say street cred, but a lot of street cred at the time. Um, and even heading into the following years was like, you know, oh, Fulop is somebody that can play against these Japanese players where a lot of the American players just got rolled through on stuff. Now... Fulop had some things going for him that were, to be honest with you, very unintentional. Um, the biggest is that he played Blossom. And at the time, um, essentially, Fulop played Blossom for Walrun, which Walrun was another hype deck coming into the tournament. But essentially, um, I can spell it right. Um, but essentially, it could, they would play like Crystal Shard, so they'd send in Walrun. They could one shot through a Quasi EX, but they'd hit for 50 damage. And then um, you could Oracle Energy on top, use Crush Draw. Sheer Cold would be really annoying if you use multiple Sheer Colds over the course of the game. Eventually, you're going to start hitting some heads. Um, but basically, what Fulop found is with the Heal Dance and then the 30 resistance to water, Blossom could just wall the Walrun almost indefinitely. And it was very, 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 very hard for them to get over a, a Blossom. Um, and at that point, I mean, Blaziken was still Blaziken. It had a lot of really strong things it could do outside of Blossom, but that Blossom would basically turn an auto loss into a very favorable matchup. Ironically, that Blossom also ended up being very, very good against the Team Magma deck because Team Magma's Groudon is weak 
to grass, Solar Beam would do 50, double to 100, it could knock out a Groudon in one hit. Solar Heal Dance in general is also very good against Groudon, because if you basically try to stream the Ruby Sapphire Blaze Guns against it, um, you could just Heal Dance, they'd hit you for 50, you'd Heal Dance them down to 30, and then they would still need a Dark Energy to knock out the Groudon. Now, I think the biggest mistake that players made at the time was in that matchup, almost every single player would just throw Blaze Gun EX after Blaze Gun EX at the Team Magma deck, when in reality, I think the best strategy really was just trying to loop the Ruby Sapphire Blaze Guns. You get, you know, multiple Fire Streams off. You're going to start taking bench prizes. Um, you're going to start getting one-hit KOs on bench things. Um, you know, if they bring up a Groudon, if you did five Fire Streams, you could... It's not super common, but you could knock it out in one hit because it already had 50 damage on it. So I think that Blossom was an unintended tech. The other thing that Fulop did very, very, very well is he put less emphasis on Rayquaza than a lot of other players did. Where everybody, like I said, at the time played two, three Rayquazas, where Fulop was more just like, you know, Blaziken's good. Blaziken EX is good. Rayquaza is just more of a, you know, if I get in trouble, I'll throw it up there. Even though he did play very heavy into it with the three multi and then the two lightning energy. Um, he played the mag Team Magma's Manetric. You don't see this as commonly anymore, but at the time it was very, very good. You could loop Volcanic Ashes, just get multiple Volcanic Ashes off every single turn. Um, also a situationally good attacker. But the big thing was, is Full played a very consistent deck. And he's the first one we see that plays four Copycat, four Stevens, four Rare Candy. Still takes advantage of that Oracle engine. That Pokemon Nurse was actually huge. He won his top four match off of that Pokemon Nurse on a Blaze and the X. Um, but essentially with the Manetric in particular, you can nurse a Blaze Gun EX, put it at zero, and then still Manetric all your energies back up to the active Blaze Gun, and then ideally use Blaze Kick or Volcanic Ash Gun. Um, one Elms, one Town Volunteers. Fulop ended up commenting the Town Volunteers was dead the whole weekend. He wish he wouldn't have played it, but you still see this on a lot of Blaze Gun lists today. And then the big thing is, is he played that one copy of Friend Ball. Um, the only, he was the only person that like really, really played Friend Ball at the time, like it just wasn't very common at all, but it was such a good play in this deck because Blaziken was the biggest deck in the format. So it was very common you could use Friend Ball to search for one of the Blaziken pieces, but at the same time too, everybody played Dunsparce, everybody played Delcaddy, so that Friend Ball could get your own Delcaddy, Rayquaza EX, even your own Dunsparce, and Manetric being dual type ironically worked out well where you could, in some situations, like against Magma, even get the Manetric. Obviously he didn't, I don't think that being able to Friend ball on a Team Magma's Groudon was exactly his idea for playing the Friend Ball, but it was one of those unintended consequences that worked out really well for him. Energy lineup, once again, played very high energy, 16 energy. Um, the thing to note is he doesn't actually play a way to get energy back other than Town Volunteers. So he, at times you did want that higher energy because you wanted to be able to energy draw and then ideally draw into additional energy. The scariest thing is, is when you got a single energy, you really want to attach it for your turn. But at the same time, too, you also want to use energy draw and draw cards. So it was kind of this risk versus reward situation. And having a few additional energy in the deck played really well into hopefully seeing another energy off that energy draw. But basically what ended up happening in the finals is in both the juniors and seniors divisions, both players got 2 would um, Fulop got 2 would in the finals. I think, I want to say in, two, in top 8, he 2 would or 2 won the Magma deck. Top four against Go was a um, was a third game. He won a very close third game. And then against Yamato, he got 2-0. And I think one of the other kind of interesting, I guess, side facts here is the player that ended up getting, I think it was third or fourth, Go Miyamoto um, and Yamato were best friends. I guess I shouldn't say that. I don't think Go's last name was Yamato. But Go and Yamato were, were best friends. Um, they played together, they tested together, they ran very similar decks and lists together. Um, I'm sure from their point of view, it was very disappointing for those two not to play in the finals. But Full played a very good game against Go, ended up coming out with a win on it. Um, and played Yamato in the finals. I believe that's right. I believe Full played Go in the top four. I don't think he played the other Magma deck. Because the top four at the time was Full Up's Blazing and then three Magmas. So I could be wrong on that, but I, I think that's right. Um... Other than that, just a really, really good Blaze Gun list by Fulop that's held up over the course of time. And you'll see some variations. Um, a lot of Blaze Gun lists nowadays you'll see play like Underground Expedition. I know we we started doing that a while back. We covered that on the channel as well as a good counter or a good alternative to it. 
Um, but other than that, Phillips list is held up incredibly, incredibly well. And then the last thing we're going to do real quick here is just talking about um, Robert Schultz, who ended up winning the 2004 box tournament I held last year with Team Magma. And the formats changed dramatically, but the thing that worked out really well for Robin is Gorbis has basically become one of the best decks in the 2004 format. And unironically, Groudon does very well against Gorbis um, in the format. And I think you see a very similar list to what Yamato played. And we'll, we'll move them down here. They're very, very, very close. Um, I think you see him move a Zangus into the Numble spot, which makes sense because you see fewer Requaza nowadays. Other than that, the Pokemon lineup is the same. Um, the energy lineup, I think he actually plays an additional energy. He plays that extra fire energy in there. Um, the only thing that seems a little odd to me in this is I, I don't... His supporter lineup, I feel, is very, very, very low. Um, because I think he actually plays fewer supporters than Yamato did. Yeah, he actually plays fewer supporters than Yamato did. And I think... I really don't think you should play less than four Stevens and four Copycat in this. Everything else, though, was ingenious. And a couple of things... That Yamato or um, that Robin did really, really, really well as he played those four reversals, and he knew that a lot of the Blaziken decks played Blossom, and that would be a major, major, major threat to him. So by playing the four reversals and then that Fire Energy, Camera Up could one shot the Blaziken, move an Energy back to a Groudon to be safe on the bench. Um, and as soon as Ra and we saw this in, mul in in multiple games that he played, but as soon as Robin would deal with the um, the the I'm sorry the blossom um the blazing matchup became much 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 easier for him and we'd also seen a lot of games where Robin just played you know magma is just a very straightforward very easy deck to set up and he would take advantage of a lot of other decks you know poor setups that relied on stage twos reversal was also very good against Gorbis where you'd see Robin you know reversal up like um, a clean pearl or something, get a really cheap, easy knockout on it, start taking some pressure off himself, some heat off of himself. Um, the only thing that was kind of rough is you see that both the rainbow energies and the psychic energy does play into that Gorbis damage as well. So that does require a little bit of um, tough playing, but just <clears throat> really, really cool to see, not only see like a, t I think Robin won Worlds was a 2018 but to see a later world champion world champion come back and win a 2004 tournament with the deck that won Worlds in 2004 and just kind of seeing the differences in them was really, really cool. And I think Robin borrowed very heavily from Yamato, obviously, but definitely understood that 2004 format and made some changes to, the, to, to his 2004 Magma deck um, that a lot of players, myself included, just hadn't really considered seriously like Reversal and ended up doing very, very well with it. But anyways, that's going to go ahead and wrap up the video. I hope you enjoyed the insight on why Team Magma won. And maybe some of those stories and kind of interesting facts from back in the day as well. Anyways, um, I hope to see you in the next video.